Hello and welcome to Hecate's History Part 2. I am going to be covering the period from roughly the start of the Common Era. You may be more familiar with that as kind of the, the delineation between time that was BC versus time that's AD. We tend to use Common Era and before the Common Era, so CE and BCE now. And of course, because of the institutionalization in Christianity in our Western society, this is thought to correlate with um, Jesus's life. So we are entering into this space of exploring Hecate's history in this moment in time when it is believed that Jesus walked the earth and in the centuries thereafter, as the Romans institutionalized, there's that word again, um, Christianity. So just to recap, in the first part of Hecate's history, I explored roughly 2000 years ish, or maybe 1000 to 1500 years ish, depending on whether you count kind of like pre the specific name of Hecate appearing in historical documents um, of her history. So really in part one, uh, I would highlight um, Hesiod's Theogony as the point when Hecate becomes really clearly named, although there are older references to her specifically by name and older artifacts as well. So this is that specific moment. And also the moment when we know the Homeric hymn to Demeter was likely written down for the first time, that that was around that same time, around that same time of Euripides version of Medea. But we know these stories and these understandings are much older than when it appears in written form. So, you know, about 800 years of pinpointed um, records, and then roughly probably a thousand years before that, when Hecate would have been known by name, perhaps. Although, of course, that would be subject to a lot of academic discussion. Um, so we're entering this in, we've traveled through that time, we've traveled through kind of pre-Hecate being named as Hecate, great mother history dating back thousands of years, then landing to about a thousand years before where we're entering today, when we have multiple sources of uh, descriptions of Hecate. So we traveled uh, quite far and we are now at the start of the common era. In the first part, I did kind of venture into the common era a little bit. I talked about the Chaldean oracles. I talked about the Greek magical papyri, and they are believed to straddle the, uh, you know, the time before the common era. And so they're kind of situated around that. I'm going to be shifting the lens to really discussing um, Hecate in the common era right up until today. So there's a lot to get through, like there was with the first episode. I'm going to try to keep this to about an hour, um, and I have been divining what to include and what not to include, because there is so much to cover. And if I had to have a key word for this second half of Hecate's history, I would call it the Dark Ages and Reemergence, because with the rise of Christianity, there is a flatlining of the sacred feminine, all faces of the sacred feminine, not just Hecate, where there is a hyper emphasis on what is solar, so what is bright and rational, not symbolic, not intuitive, that there's an emphasis on progress, so-called civilization, and so on. And before we kind of get into specifically to Hecate during this period, so covering 
this 2000 years from the start of the common era to today, I want to mention a book called The Goddess Versus the Alphabet by Dr. Leonard Schlein. This is a very interesting theory that he presents in the book, which is that with the rise of the alphabet and the written word, the sacred feminine went through a period of decline. And this is all this right brain, left brain, brain business. If you are familiar with the research on left brain and right brain, you'll know that the research is scant and there's a lot of debate about whether there's any validity to it. But his idea is sound and that there is something about the sacred feminine that gets squished by an overly rational world. So that book again is The Goddess Versus the Alphabet by Leonard Schlein. So let's go into it with that idea as kind of like a, 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 a place for us to circle around. That there were things happening in the world that started happening centuries before, but that with the start of the Common Era and the rise of the Roman Empire really became amplified. And there was this hyper emphasis on what could be written down, what could be measured, what could be evaluated, what could be seen with the naked eye. I always liken this to behavior psychology. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's um, like Skinner and so on with uh, everything to do with understanding human behavior. You know, you could measure it in a box. You could put a pigeon in a box and get the pigeon to push a lever. And that's what we needed to know. It also in some ways reminds me of cognitive behavior therapy, which you may be familiar with, which is the idea, you know, like we have thoughts, thoughts are measurable, tangible things, and we can change them in a very rational, non-emotional way. So there's like that complete denial of what of emotions and what we know from more recent research on emotions is that like emotions are the thing that we lead with. So Schlein's thesis that the rise of the alphabet led to the decline of the sacred feminine, I think is valid in many ways. And I would add to it the rise of the mind over the rise of the root. So the mind, it's like we can think our way through anything. Feelings are problematic. And I would say that the sacred feminine dwells more in the more, not entirely, more in the realm of emotions than it does in the realm of intellect. Of course, it stretches into the realm of intellect. It's not, this isn't like black and white business. And I would say further that the sacred feminine, be it Hecate or otherwise, when allowed to flourish in all of its complexity and beauty, its healing power, its destructive power, I would say that when we allow all of that out, it is a profoundly emotional experience. And I believe why we are so fascinated with Hecate here today is that she fundamentally represents this kind of complex feeling, intuitive, deeper self. And that this is a sort of rectification in a world gone mad with artificial light, rationality, measurement, um, you know, success is gauged by how much money you have. It's about counting. It's not about feeling. It's not about experiencing. And I would say that in looking at the history of the, the great mother and so much more, one thing that I've really observed in my thematic approach to understanding what's going on here is that when we deny what is emotional, intuitive, introspective, contemplative, that that is a denial of the sacred feminine. And Hecate, of course, is a very complex character in all of this. 
because she follows this trail of having been one uh, label assigned to the great mother archetype to being a nefarious goddess associated with witches and the black arts and demons and hell and such and all of the beautiful beneficial at benevolent attributes assigned to her in earlier times as the roman empire gains force as we move through the centuries more into christianity all of those good things about hecate are sliced off at least in what we know in terms of um, sources you know what we have in terms of written documents and art and so on so there's a lot and this is a I think a much more difficult period for understanding Hecate's history because it's really entwined with what we may be sensing in our own lives. You know, that what is real and true and nourishing to us is denied by popular culture. And, you know, that Hecate has kind of gone through a metamorphosis or on that later a metamorphosis herself where she was this great mother figure that had all sorts of powers of creation and destruction magic and healing and all of these things to a figure who is very much someone to be avoided who causes you know a lot of trouble and represents paganism witchcraft um you know what they would call like uncivilized things and so on so there's this, it's a very complex discussion i'll be talking a lot about maybe difficult things so make sure you take good care of yourself as we go into this discussion of hecate's history so we definitely need to light our candle for this talk And this has a, a sigil, a symbol I've made of Hecate as Scotia. Scotia means of the dark, of the shadows, of the gloom, uh, and comes to us from a temple to Hecate in Egypt. So let's work with this energy of that dark mother aspect that became so vilified. Um, with the rise of the Roman Empire and so on. So let's just counterclockwise, banishing all barriers to exploring this epic of he Hecate's history. And let's circle ourselves together in connection and protection as we go into this challenging discussion about this period. So I thought for the invocation for this, I would use a quote that I find both humorous and very telling. It is not so much the thieves and the wild animals accustomed to disturb the place that concern and bother me, so much as the women who try to twist human minds with spells and poisons. I just cannot put an end to these women or stop them collecting bones and destructive herbs once the wandering moon brings out her comely face. So this is in Horace's satires, which was uh, likely written around 30 years before the Common Era. And the speaker is a wooden statue of Priapus, who's watching over the cemetery, speaking about two of Hecate's ancient witches. Like I said, I find this funny because I identify with this. You know, I feel a bit called out by this. It's like, well, I don't try to twist human minds, but, you know, I do go about with my spells and poisons and generally try to upset the status quo. So that is our invocation is understanding why it became so challenging to these writers such as Horace here and others, um, women who were out of bounds, women who wouldn't bow down to civilization, 
women who tried to grasp the future in their hands, who were, wanted to be in charge of their own lives and how that is becoming so problematic. It was already problematic, but it's becoming even more amplified now, really accelerating. So there are different, so let's stay with the time. So the, the Roman Empire is strong through this early centuries of the common era. It's, it's expanding past, you know, what we could typically think of as Italy and the Mediterranean. It's growing. There is a thing that happens on the battlefield. This guy says, if you do this thing, you'll win, but it's like Jesus says. And so the, the general does the thing and they win. And then Christianity becomes the official religion of Rome. And I wanted to say that to the ancient Rome, Romans, the swapping of Jesus for deities that were important to them at this time was not like such a huge thing because you know they already had like Saul Invictus and others and it you know it had gotten started with Apollo and so on with the Greeks like this idea of this solar son of God who lit up the world and who was like the spirit of civilization and reinforcing what we call patriarchy today that that was already a thing so basically what happened is i mean if you look at like the festival i think it was to Saul Invictus and Christmas day like it was just like they just traded it was like they got a new uh actor for the role of the sun god and that you know so there's all this business happening and then there is this really strong push to get rid of the sacred feminine. And, you know, there's been so much scholarship around this, but why this is happening. I mentioned Schlein's work about like, is it the alphabet and this need for rationality? Um, is it the need for commerce? Like what is going on that really this shift that had been happening become so accelerated at this period in time. And, you know, this drive for expansion um, for bigger states, you know, like, so not smaller states, like what the Greeks maybe had, even though they had an empire, but like for the, you know, the Roman empire was massive in terms of geography, you know, extending to the British Isles. Like, so it's this huge need for a lot of structure and a need for workers and a need for someone to take care of those workers so the workers could do the work and also the need you know for what is that that saying uh, to make new romans you know women were needed to make new romans so there is all of this going around and christianity becomes like the official religion and if you study this history and if you study the New Testament, you'll see that what Jesus actually said, according to those letters that are recorded as the New Testament, is very different even today than how Christianity is often perpetuated or often inflicted on people. Like even today, you'll see, you know, like, gay marriage is wrong, abortion is wrong, and so on. You know, it's like the Bible says, and, you know, that's like the words of Jesus and the stories of Jesus being used a very certain way to advance a political agenda. And that is what's happening here. So what we have is different uh, anti-pagan works emerging during this time, such as the Pistis Sophia and the Preparatio Evangelica. And I think think I will read a couple of passages from the Preparatio Evangelica. So Preparatio Evangelica was written by a man named um, Eusebius around the fourth century in the Common Era. So we're seeing that Christianity is becoming the official state religion. 
Preparatio Evangelica translates to preparation for the gospel or like the Christian gospel or, you know, preparation to evangelize. So this document is not pro Hecate or pro the old gods or pro the old magic. It's against all of that. So let's let's explore a couple of passages from that. The speaker is Pan. So you may be familiar with Pan, who was a rural, mostly pagan god associated with fertility and so on. The speaker is Pan. Evil spirits drive afar, then set upon the fire, set wax, gleaming fair with colors three, white and black must mingle there with the glowing embers red, terror to the dogs of hell, then let Hecate's dread form hold in her hand a blazing torch and the avenging sword of fate, while closely round the goddess wrapped a snake fast holds in his coils and wreathes about her awful brow. Let the shining key be there and the far resounding scourge symbol of the demon's power. I find this very beautiful and enchanting. And at the same time, we have to be aware that this was written um, to turn minds against Hecate and the other pagan deities and the pagan practice. So let's read another passage. And the moon at one time Artemis and another Athena and again Hecate and Aletheia. Aletheia is um, a title of Hecate and Artemis, but also was a goddess in her own right. And she was associated with childbirth, um, pregnancy, and so on. Are they not again convicted of deifying the creature rather than the creator and the handiwork of the world, but not the worker with great risk and danger and with mischief that must fall on their own head. So you can see here the sentiment of the times and that all of these goddesses were nothing but trouble and they we're deifying the creature rather than the creator. And this is important for us to consider as the rise of God the Father, um, which wasn't a new idea at all. We have Zeus and other deities certainly in that area long before this situation happened. But the vilifying the sacred feminine um, at the same time, of course, I want to give a shout out to Mary as the mother of Jesus and, you know, with the formation of the Catholic Church, that Mary was given a very specific role and that Mary was seen as passive, um, loving, kind. You know, if you've been to a Catholic Church and you've seen those beautiful works of art, many of them, Mary is, you know, holding the baby Jesus. She's very loving. She, of course, you know, it was a divine or immaculate conception. So, you know, it wasn't like she did the dirty work of having sex. She was super pure. So you can see if we if we juxtapose what Eusebius is saying here with the kind of Catholic Christian way of seeing Mary as being pure, she's not powerful, she's loving, she's possibly healing, but not in a big powerful way. And that God and Jesus, well, the, the Holy Trinity, you know, Jesus, God and the Holy Ghost are, you know, they're, they're masculine and they are the, the dominant forces. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that there weren't other expressions and understandings of the sacred feminine during this time. Certainly like we see Sophia um, and other figures throughout this time. And I did an episode on the Sibyls, which they were actual women who lived, not goddesses or spirits. Uh, and what happens to them during this time, I think it's really helpful to listen to all of that episode after you listen and watch this one, because we get into a lot of the history about what's happening 
during this time and why the Sibyls went from being very powerful women who were, um, you know, seers, we might call them psychics today, and very important to government and community to basically being just used and abused. And this is what happens with like the sacred feminine in general, is that it gets pushed aside, it becomes less powerful. Um, the dangerous or wild aspects, Artemis, Athena, Hecate, Aletheia, um, all of these goddesses, you know, they, they're, they're just wrong. They're focused on the creature rather than the creator. We should be focused on, you know, um, living this life and doing all the right things so we can enter heaven, which is very different than the underworld, right? When we think the underworld is like the womb, the womb of the goddess, and we return to the earth, we return to the womb. Well, the idea of heaven is, you know, like it's some kind of celestial plane. I've never, ever been able to wrap my head around heaven. So I'm not the expert on it. it makes no sense to me. But, you know, like heaven is like some far off celestial plane that after we die, we will go to. So, you know, that idea, right, is that while well, we used to return to the womb of the cave, the womb, the ground, to Cathonia, but now we like zoom off to some realm on high and God is very detached. God is not of the earth. And that's what uh, Eusebius is talking about here. The creator, God the Father, is way up here doing gaudy things. And the goddesses were way down here. They were on the earth. They were with us. They were among us. And, you know, in the Greek mythology, the, the, they walk among us and they do very human things. And they're very messy and very complicated. And this is being replaced. Again, this has been coming centuries in the coming. This has been replaced by this God, the father, who um, is both loving, but harsh and punitive. There are very specific things, but when, if there's one thing God the Father doesn't do is, you know, mess with, like, come down with humans and hang out with humans and do human-like things. Jesus, of course, was a human, but he was granted divinity um, by being reborn after being entombed in a, a cave for three days. Um, so, you know, there's these kind of aspects of the Jesus story that hearken to the sacred feminine and jesus in what i've read you know i've read different books on um the life of jesus if jesus is considered a historical figure on the life of jesus and you know he was very pro sacred feminine but the romans who institutionalized christianity and used his name were not they went from having many festivals and celebrations of the sacred feminine to slowly over time those things became less and less important related to this it would also be like the rituals at eleusis which had existed for hundreds of years and this uh mimicked the cycle of uh, life death and birth told in the Persephone myth and Demeter and Persephone and Hecate as the liminal mediator between the two were the central uh, deities in this ritual cycle with the decline of those festive that those rites which you know were accessible to any Greek to go to them you didn't have to be a fancy person if you could get there you could do you could have this experience so those rituals, you know, went into decline as well, and were Demeter and Persephone were eventually replaced by Catholic um, saints. So they still exist. The sacred feminine always finds her way and will always exist in a culture, even when there are these institutional state level restrictions on the sacred feminine. So even though, you know, I, I mentioned Mary as being this beatific uh, character, 
There was also the Black Madonnas and so on that were much more complex figures. So there's always space for this. It always finds a way. The Great Mother, in all of her complexities, in her darkness and her light, with her pale moonlight, she always finds a way. And to bring us back to, you know, the fourth century, there is this systemic push to denouncing the so-called pagan gods in general and really the energy of getting rid of those messy pagan goddesses. So let's move on through the centuries. Um, so Roman, the Roman poet Ovid and his Metamorphoses so what the Romans did is they took a lot of the Greek stories that had been told and retold them. This worked with plays, with stories and so on. So Ovid's Metamorphoses is believed to have been written around the eighth century CE. And in this, you know, he tells, retells all of the Greek stories Medea's story, Circe's story, and so on, and kind of dials up a few notches how the later versions of these stories portrayed these expressions of the sacred feminine, makes them a little bit more scary, a little bit more insane, um, you know, just makes them feel much more I would say pilloried there is clearly like almost a misogynist idea that a certain type of woman who won't conform to society who insists on creating her own destiny that she is for lack of a better word crazy and not to be trusted and dangerous and that men are always right and women who know that men are always right well those are the good women so let's just read a little tiny bit of the section from the Metamorphoses, um, where it tells Circe's part in um, Odysseus's or Ulysses' great story. So this is about Circe casting a spell. Instead, she sprinkled them with noxious drugs and poisonous concoctions, and summoning up night and all of his gods that dwell below in Erebus and Chaos, she called upon the goddess Hecate with long-drawn ululations. Astonishing to say it, but the woods leapt from their place, the earth shuddered, the nearby trees turned white, and so on, and ere Hecate came, so there is this terrifying aspect of Hecate. You know, she comes with her hounds, the earth cleaves, there's lightning. She is terrifying. And, you know, Ovid's work and the popular plays of the time, like Medea, they just serve to reinforce this idea of Hecate as being associated with what is off limits. So this kind of carries on for the centuries. Um, and through the Dark Ages and into the medieval period. And I want to just mention, so there are different illustrations of Hecate in the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance that were designed not to venerate Hecate or Circe or Athena or any of them. They were like Christian propaganda designed to you know, show how barbaric times were before the rise of Christianity. So René Boivin, I think it's spelled B-O-Y-V-I-N, um, in a series of illustrations, in a, like a book, which was basically like depictions of the Greek myths. So it shows a picture of a triple-headed Hecate, uh, the one that I'm looking at right now, it, there's Medea working on her spell. There's poor Jason, you know, who is her victim and Hecate, triple headed Hecate in the background. I believe it was this same illustrator who did um, an image of Hecate as having three animal heads around this time in the Middle Ages. So these are aspects of Hecate known since antiquity, but they are being used in a very specific way now. It's kind of like 
you know, when the, the thing that is off limit, it's like, look, this is a bad thing and don't worship these gods. Don't get involved with these myths. They're nothing but trouble. And at the same time, it's very alluring. What we also need to be mindful of at this point in history that we've reached is that this is also the time of the Maleficus Maleficarum. I think I got that out right. I always say that wrong, um, which was a document that claimed to talk about witchcraft and the evils of witchcraft. It was like just the twisted imaginations of a psychotic man, really, who was just out to get people. But anyway, so this book comes out around this time. Witchcraft is bad. The people who do witchcraft are evil. They're against Christianity. They cavort with the devil and so on. So that is what's happening in this time. Hecate, of course, is very much part of this because of this history. You know, we I, just a little bit I've shared from Metamorphoses, um, the Preparatio Evangelico. In the first part, you know, I talked about Euripides Medea. Uh, certainly Homer's Odyssey, like these sources that would have been known to the powerful at that time that had kind of, you know, trailed through history, that they were very much, you know, Hecate is the queen of witches, she's evil, what she's going to do is inspire women to summon her and work with poisons and not put up with the bullshit of society, they're going to be the rebels, and so all of this is going on. And of course, this leads to, you know, the witch trials, which wasn't really, it's complicated, but the witch trials in Europe and specifically, I think in Scotland and England were more about just people that the powerful didn't like and getting rid of them. It, whether any of them were what we might call today with kind of the modern understanding of which as someone who practices natural magic and is interested in astrology and the cards and herbalism like whether any of those people were that um, you know it gets really complicated because a lot of this was literally like a witch hunt just to use this book that says how bad witchcraft is um, and the early Kind of like the advocates of this and the different men who really took this on as their cause it was about getting rid of people they didn't like uh, people who didn't conform and a lot of those of course were women but not only women so anybody outside the status quo anybody we might say today who was marginalized anybody who resisted um, anybody who you know wouldn't follow the rules of the town anybody who wouldn't go to church um, or even those who did so that all of this is going on so the witch trials are going on and then another thing happens that i want to mention is that the king james bible comes out round about this period and you know the king james bible really amped up the language in my opinion at least um to make women seem more dangerous and wrong and that you know men were wise and justified and really kind of if you look at the original greek for like the books of the new testament what's being said is often quite different than what we believe the bible says today because the king james edition of the bible has been so influential Again, that King James Bible um, was part of the state. You know, it was a mandate to really bring the masses into conformity, to become, you know, to, to become obedient and subservient. It, you know, this is Christianity being used as a tool of the state. Of course, you know, there were many Christian saints at this time who were women who got themselves in all kinds of trouble for resisting um, what was being pushed down at them. And many of them, of course, Joan of Arc would be the most famous one. 
So there's a lot of organization against anybody who bucks the system and a particular emphasis on women who won't bow down to the patriarchy. That's where we're at. And now we have set the stage for Shakespeare. So I often will say that's Macbeth Shakespeare, just as like a heuristic for talking about the Hecate of this time. So Shakespeare comes along super influenced by uh, things like the Metamorphoses and earlier works, and in many ways re retells those stories so they are more suited for a man of his ilk during his time and with his belief structure. So in Macbeth, Macbeth's Hecate, you know, is this queen of witches that presides over the weird sisters and, you know, inspires and delights in the dark arts. Shakespeare wasn't finished with Hecate in just Macbeth, though, although she is a character in Macbeth. And it's interesting in some versions of Macbeth and performances of Macbeth, like Hecate gets left out. And there was this interesting one I that was done a few years ago that I watched the recording of, of Macbeth. And there's also the, the newest version from the Coen brothers of Macbeth, which I think is on um, Apple. So if you have Apple TV, you can watch this newest version of that. And there are scenes in that that are very evocative. So the Macbeth story, you know, this hero's journey story where, you know, women are problematic and the queen of witches herself is, you know, a, an integral part of the story in many ways, whether she makes an obvious appearance or not, you know, it that is like this flashpoint of if the women would just stop it with their magic, their intuition, their emotions, all would be well in the world. But then he goes on, even in Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, I've got a little quote here I pulled from Midsummer Night's Dream. So let's just read that. And we fairies that do run by triple Hecate's team from the presence of the sun following darkness like a dream, now our frolic, not a mouse, shall disturb this hallow house. I am sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door. So there's this reference to Hecate's team. And, you know, this is about spirits. This is about troublesome energy and so on. So there is all of this business percolating a hatred of magic, but it's not really a hatred of magic. It's just a hatred of anybody who is outside the status quo. Uh, you know, like, let's be honest, the Holy Ghost in Christianity is like a magical spirit. Um, Jesus worked magic himself. So it's not any magic. It's any magic that's not state sanctioned magic. The Catholic mass at this time would have been done like in Latin. There's also... I should say in England, you know, there's also the break with uh, Catholicism and the formation of the Church of England, which moved even further from the sacred feminine, having any kind of role of power. At least the Catholic Church, you know, all the saints, many female saints like, um, you know, Bridget, the goddess Bridget, evolved into St. Bridget and so on, you know, so there's, but the Church of England, like kind of that gets turned down. Like, so there's more of this happening. And then there's also um, like the, the, the beginning of the Protestant church as a backlash against Catholicism. And in the Protestant church, of course, Mary and the sacred feminine dial down even more for the most part and really rooted in different ideas about what life was. So this is like, you see the rise of the Puritans, the rise of, you know, there's, this is when um, Calvin, so we've, we're traveling a few 
traveling across the years. Um, so we get into the period of like Calvinism. And if you think of the pilgrims in the United States, like what they stood for, that kind of puritanical, we don't drink, we don't do anything wrong, you know, very, very rigid. It's about working from sunup to sundown, um, serving God. We are basically all super sinful creatures and we have to do all these things. So we're not sinful. This is completely different than what the Greeks would have believed, um, which is that, you know, like that more so that we have miasma and we need to be cleansed. And if we are truly shitty people, we'll end up in the bad parts of the underworld. But this is very punitive. Like the pur the Puritans are very, very punitive. And like we still see vestiges of this in North America. You know, ideas like of sin, of repentance, of being born again, and that only Jesus can like wash away your sins. Um, but there's also really softer versions of this, of course, but I mean, like there is that harsher version of Christianity and this idea of original sin. And I think this is a good point to kind of talk about that idea of original sin as we are, you know, really like we've moved into the 1600s and beyond. We're coming closer to this top, you know, we're moving closer to the 20 first century. And the idea of original sin that comes from the book of Genesis in the Bible is really important just to kind of contextualize everything at this point in the story. Because in the book of Genesis, it is Eve, the woman, the original woman, who picks the fruit that is offered by the serpent. And if you think back to that quote um, from the Preparatio Evangelica, you know, this business about Hecate having snakes twined around her. So the snake by this time, by the 16, 1700s, has really become in many ways a symbol of evil associated with the devil and so on. Whereas before all of this, like back to before the common era, the snake was seen as, you know, like the symbol of rebirth, regeneration, um, you know, poison, but also healing and so on, and very connected to the sacred feminine. So in the Bible, when the snake became the devil and this apple that was the forbidden fruit, which was the forbidden fruit symbolizes um, humans power over their own lives basically when eve succumbed to the apple and was tempted by the serpent and god had to come in and, and fix this mess and said now all humans are sinful that was there's a big long history maybe someday i'll do an episode on just on that but there's a big meaning to that right it's that the sacred feminine eve is evil and is earthly and what is right is to not be of this earth. What is right is to aspire to heaven. And the only way to get to heaven, the only way for a decent afterlife is by renouncing sin and by leading a life that conforms, um, you know, to the tenets of Christianity. This is as um, the Protestant church grew so the catholic church had always kind of had this you know you have to do penance um there were charms and things you could buy that would relieve you of sins and then of course the catholic confessional all of these things this idea of sin is really really strong during this period and you know the founders of uh, you know like the puritans the pilgrims who founded that part of the call, I shouldn't say found, I should say colonized, raped and pillaged and did horrible things um, to the area that we know was New England. This is what they believed. This is what they brought to North America and other areas that were settled by the French, you know, Catholicism was brought. And then uh, in areas that were colonized, not founded, colonized, 
colonized by the British, that, you know, all of these ideas are coming with them and they are coming to the new world where there had never been such an emphasis on, you know, we're sinners uh, and, and this idea that women are basically dangerous. Women are like the sinners. If anybody is going to sin here, it's going to be women. And they also cause trouble and inspire sin in others. So colonization is pushing that idea into North America. And, and you can see even in stories like the story, A Sad Tale of Pocahontas, it's just like how little they valued the First Nations people and in particular, like women were of no value and men were, of, sorry, men were of more value, but children were of very little value. And, you know, like even the rise of the slave trade, all of this is about getting work done because work, money, capitalism is important and the sacred feminine, which maybe isn't associated with these things, um, is renounced more and more. And then what happens? So now we've moved in, let's just travel across the centuries a bit more. And now let's get into the Victorian era. So mid to late 1800s, early part of the 20th century. What happens, and just kind of predating that, there is a movement, an artistic movement known as Romanticism that kind of predates just the Victorian era, where there is a renewed interest in all things Greek and Roman and in the myths and so on. So we, this is where, you know, like a lot of the statues, and if you think of like an English country estate that has all these Greek statues and why would they be there? This is a very Christian place. But there is a renewed interest because of romanticism in all of these stories. It's not so much interested in the religious aspects, but there is some of that too. And if you look at like Shelley, uh, William Blake, and others floating around during this period, you can see that they are approaching all of this mythology from the Greeks and Romans and doing interesting things with it, though certainly a lot of them uh, were doing it from the, the, the lens of the, being a man of their times, where, you know, there's still this idea that women are risky business um, and, you know, basically have a function to take care of men and support men, but aren't people in their own right. So we're, so that's the romanticism, we backpedal a little bit now, let's go back to the Victorian era. So there's all this increased in, uh, interest in the Greeks and Romans, in their stories, and even in their history. So there existed, you know, like this vast database, basically, of all these ancient texts that had quite shockingly survived all the centuries. And sometimes it was about the original text, but there was also like a lineage of like Ovid's metamorphoses being written by, you know, like being studied and then someone in the Middle Ages had to take on it and so on. So there was a lot of that that had happened in the, you know, the centuries as well. But we land in the Victorian era and on the trails of Romanticism and there is a scholarly interest in Greek mythology, Greek and Roman mythology, uh, Greek and Roman religious practices, and there's all of this going on. And if you want a way to kind of enter into like what this might have been like, like this is also the period of all of the great archaeological excavations of the ancient world. So if you think of like those English uh, explorers going to Egypt and like emptying tombs and taking all the stuff back to England. You know, there's that is the mindset of this time. They are not kind of seeking to understand, they are seeking to conquer. So let's look at an example from one book. Um, well, it's actually it's five volumes, but one really important um, treatise on the Greek states and their religious practices and so on that came out during the uh, during the Victorian era. 
So this was by L Lewis Richard Farnell. He published five volumes. It's a huge thing. Uh, and he called it the cults of the Greek states. He, you know, he covers all the Greek deities. It's huge. It's fascinating. And I thought we would just look at a small passage on this from his section on Hecate. Hecate came down into Greece as an earth goddess with the usual interest that such a divinity always had in vegetation and nutrition, in wild and human life, but possessing also certain attractions for the moon and trailing with her a very pernicious cloud of superstition and sorcery. So there is this, what is natural, what is connected to the earth, what's, you know, dirty, you know, connected to agriculture, the land, the wild animals. The, and so what is not in favor of the built environment of more civilization, bigger buildings, more money, that is Hecate. And because she has this very deep connection to like the lived messy complicated human experience that she that with her is this business of superstition and sorcery of course hecate was associated with sorcery it's a long history of that but that you know in this short quote it really emphasizes how what is godly what is right um, is disconnected from wild and human life. And if, if something is connected to wild and human life, then it has this superstition, sorcery, wildness, savageness about it. So I wanted just to pull that out. So here we are, we're round about 1900 now. And I debated whether or not to talk about this particular individual because I find so much about their work incredibly toxic. Uh, but there is also a lot to be kind of gleaned in examining Hecate's history and kind of how these, so if you look at the Victorians who were working at translating these texts and they took their specific lens of the time to the translation of these texts, just as Ovid way back in the day had put his spin on older stories, the Victorians put their spin on it. You can see like we've got all these spins. The Bible was spun in the, the King James Version things. The spin doctors have always been with us. Um, but I want to circle back to this person. So Alistair Crowley um, had a lot to say about Hecate in some of his writings. And I believe that, you know, he was directly influenced probably by like Farnell's work and older works and formed this idea of Hecate as really being very terrifying and like incredibly misogynistic um, and all about just amplifying like Hecate is this queen of hell figure really just completely disconnected from you know the the most ancient historical writings about Hecate where she does have these destructive qualities there's no denying that but she also has uh really healing qualities you know she's she's Persephone's guide to and from the underworld so now you know we're in the 20th century Crowley is writing a lot and I I do believe that Crowley for all of his problems was hugely influential in what we might call like modern paganism, the modern occult, and so on. So I'll just read a couple of lines from his Ode to Hecate. O triple form of darkness, somber splendor, thou moon on scene of men, thou huntress dread. Thou crowned demon of the crownless dead, O oh, breasts of blood too bitter and too tender, on scene of gentle spring, let me the offering bring to thy shrines, sepulchral glittering. I slay the swart beast, I bestow the bloom sown in the dusk and gathered in the gloom under the waning moon. 
at midnight hardly lightening the east and the black lamb from the black youth's dead womb i bring and stir the slow infernal tune fit for thy chosen priest and on it goes so to me when i read this i think well clearly you know he's been influenced by euripides medea and these sources that were not about uh, religious practices involving hecate but were indeed um, stories plays myths not religious practices however this becomes this version of hecate becomes very influential and that it is almost like fetishized. You know, Hecate is this dread goddess. She's dripping blood from her breasts. Like she's the queen of hell and so on. And it's like this weird fetishization of her by toxic men, toxic white men with money. Um, and that this business, you know, kind of like becomes influential and this version of hecate even sticks with us today which frankly i used to get really pissed off about it but now i'm like if anyone believes that well good for them i don't have the capacity to deal with these people if they want to fetishize hecate and make her into some freakish monster where they can work out their mummy issues look just let them do it i'm not involved with that um, you know, I have my own mother complex, we all do. So I will work it out by exploring Hecate as a guide back to the soul and by connecting with her rich ancient history that ex makes her much larger than what this ode to Hecate would have her be. Though I do also find great beauty in this very kind of nightmarish Hecate, it's complicated. So now we have arrived in the 20th century. So you have other things happening in the 20th century. You have like Robert Graves work um, and, and Charles Leland's work. And so there is this early 20th century, things are happening, Elena Blavatsky, things are happening to kind of bring these ancient religious practices and myths in a way where they become like almost like a religious practice. And then of course you get like Gardner and others in the forties and fifties starting to create what they call Wicca. And so there's, there is this like emphasis on the sacred feminine being returned to power. And I would say like, there also is this cloud of like toxicity around a lot of it that I find super problematic. Um, and I think I kept, quiet about it for a long time, but I'm not keeping quiet about it anymore. A lot of that was toxic and it remains toxic. There's a lot of toxicity around the sacred feminine where it gets fetishized and redacted to, you know, dripping blood from your breasts and, and so on. Yes, of course, that is an aspect. It could be an aspect for some people that could even lead to healing, but it's much more complicated and much larger than that. All along, this is happening. There, of course, is the rise of what's known as second wave feminism. So, first wave feminism, you know, was Mary Wilson, Wilson Croft, I think I got that out right, um, back in the late 18th century. Interestingly, whose daughter wrote Frankenstein, we could do a whole episode on that business. Um, but there is this new wave of feminism that comes as a result of like World War II and working women working and women went back in the home in the 50s, but then that's not what they wanted. They wanted more. Wanted birth control, wanted rights, and all the this had all been percolating. And with second wave feminism comes the rise of the sacred feminine in that movement, like a reclaiming of the sacred feminine. Um, I'm going to read a passage from a book written by a psychologist, Charlene Spretnak, which was published in 1978, um, where she tells the story of Hecate, she reimagines the story of Hecate. So I'll just read a, a paragraph or so from that. In the dark of the moon, small covens awaited near her drooping willow trees. 
she appeared suddenly before them with her torch and her hounds. A nest of snakes writhed in her hair, sometimes shedding, sometimes renewing, until the new moon slit the sky. Hecate shared clues to her secrets. Those who believed understood. They saw that form was not fixed. Watch human become animal, become tree, become human. They witnessed the power of her favorite herbs, black poppy, smilax, mandragora, aconite. Awesome were her skills, but always Hecate taught the same lesson. Without death, there is no life. And I think there is a like a, a delinea delineation between this and some of the what I would call the more toxic masculine approaches to Hecate that were percolating around, you know, obviously outside of feminism, but that this is like this is feminism saying like yes we have these dark destructive powers we are not just Mary in the stained glass in the church there is a lot more to us and you know that is what uh, dr spretnak is getting at here hecate teaches that without death there is no life that there is a wholeness there this is like a blossoming you know where the sacred feminine was often very flatlined and squished down this is like you know when you get one of those um those flowers that bloom into tea and you make the tea, it's like it's coming back fully to life. And in feminism, second wave feminism, as women were reclaiming their rightful power and finding new ways to go ahead, dark goddesses or goddesses who were not just Mary on the church wall and stained glass holding baby Jesus being super happy, um, dark goddesses become really important in some areas of feminism. And then the other thing that happens, so if we loop back to Farnell and the way he portrayed Hecate, now that we're in like 1990, so we've traveled far, there is a lot of scholarship, serious scholarship that is trying to be less biased um, although, of course, still like dominant culture, uh, you know, like white privilege culture is still, they're still the ones who have their hands on all these documents to interpret. But into all of this comes um, a woman by the name of Sarah Illis Johnson, who writes her PhD dissertation on Hecate and kind of blows it open, you know, like goes so much beyond that Hecate, you know, with her hellhounds and so on. And she dives into things like the Chaldean oracles, which had been translated into English by this time. Um, and examines Hecate as the key holder or Clydocus. And I wanted to read just a passage from um, her dissertation, which was published as Hecate Soterra. Keyholder described aspects of Hecate that agreed with Proclus's portrayal of her as having the ability to bind together and harmonize diverse elements, to close the boundaries of things within the cosmos, to bring individual souls to fulfillment, in short, as an entity much like the cosmic soul or anima mundi is how I would say it, soul of the world, soul of the cosmos, soul of the universe. So that happens, that work is done in 1990. There is also a lot of more feminist scholarship around Hecate and some more like in um, like the classics. So there's a lot of scholarship around Hecate. At the same time, I would say that in kind of like the neo-pagan world, uh, there's this version of Hecate that she's super scary, off limits. Remember, she's got blood dripping from her breasts. She's got the hellhounds. She's terrifying, off limits. There is the feminist kind of take on Hecate, which is, yes, she is the dark goddess, but she has, you know, these amazing powers over death. She's much less fetishized there. Uh, and then there is kind of Dr. Johnson going in this whole different Right with Hecate saying, you know, she's so much more than any of this. There are these ancient documents that describe her as 
Adam Amundi as the key holder and so on. So all of this is happening. We have, you know, this kind of like pagan occult Hecate, we have feminist Hecate, we have scholarly Hecate, and then we have this work by Johnson um, describing Hecate as so much more than any of these other things. So there's a lot happening. This kind of leads us to James Hillman, whose book, uh, The Dream in the Underworld, was written before um, Johnson's work, so written before 1990, but his work, so James Hillman, his work really, he saw Hecate as kind of like the spirit of the underworld, the spirit of the depths, um, the dreams were her sacred territory, and so on, and he was really close to uh, a former monk, and writer and therapist named uh, Thomas Moore. And Thomas Moore wrote a book called Dark Nights of the Soul. And there is a big section in Dark Nights of the Soul that's dedicated to Hecate. Now this is where things get even more interesting. So this is now we're into the 2000s, early 2000s. And so at the time, so this is like contemporary for me trying to understand Hecate. So at the time there is like, there are different books, like neo-pagan books coming out. Like we might say witchy books coming out. There is work by scholars on Hecate. And then this book called Dark Nights of the Soul, A Guide for Finding Your Way Through Life's Ordeals by Thomas Moore comes out with a big section discuss, discussing. Hecate, now this is a, we're moved purely into the psychological. Hecate is a psychological spirit, a goddess that you can connect with. Jean Shinolda Boland's work, um, I think it's in her book, Goddesses for Women Over 50, seeing Hecate as the crone, like the wise woman. So this is that era in the two, around, around about the 2000s, when all of this work starts to come out that is very psychological. So we kind of have the, we have academic, we have feminist, we have like pagan occult witchy, um, and then we have psychological Hecate that's all kind of coming out around as we're moving into the 2000s. The thing with Thomas More is that his work gets really popularized because Oprah puts him on the show and endorses um, his books and him basically. So he gets super popular because of this and I believe, you know, that's a way, it's so interesting, like when we talk about, you know, like the great mother, the dark goddess, she always finds her way, she finds her way, she shines her torch, and her energy comes through for us to find our way to her, um, to heal ourselves, like to heal our own darkness. So I thought I would uh, finish up because we've pretty much come to the modern day. So I'll finish up the history um, by reading a passage from Moore's book, a sort of a benediction for this class. Hecate's torch illuminates the pervading darkness with a dim lunar light. In ancient classical literature, she was known as one of the daughters of the night, and with her dogs, she guards the gates of the underworld. If she is your angel, you have to learn how to think, speak, and act without countering the darkness that has hold of you. Hecate is at one with the dark. Your way of reasoning and understanding, likewise, has to be enlightening as the moon illuminates. Soft, incomplete, obscure, romantic, slightly chilling, beautiful. Psychology tends to be solar, wanting to bring all things to light to overcome the darkness and make everything manageable. It wants to banish darkness with any means at its disposal, but no one needs such a harsh cleansing and brightening. It would be better to be deepened and darkened by an experience of the night. You would then become more complex, more interesting, less one dimensional. You can see that the point of staying in the dark is not to trick you into making you brilliant and germ free, but to make you a more interesting person and to give you a more fascinating life. 
in therapeutic term in therapeutic times like ours these goals may seem odd but they are ultimately more humane rather than giving you a spotless well-adjusted personality they give you substance you become a person worth knowing worth listening to and worth loving in all of your dimensions so that is from dark nights of the soul by thomas moore so we've done we've done history we are here in 2022 2023 we are here in the covid era um, and hecate and pop culture of course she shows up in many places many tv shows american horror story that sabrina show i never watched it um and also in unexpected places, you know, a show called The White Lotus, which I love. In the first season, um, the mother goes into the room and the girls are there and she asks the girls what they're doing. And she's like, oh, we're just doing rituals to Hecate. Uh, so, you know, Hecate kind of permeates our culture in different ways now, which I think is very similar to how she would have been in the culture like 2000 years ago. You know, she was in plays, she was in religious rites, thinking back to the temple at Lagina, she was in the mythology. But the thing about Hecate, you know, through all of this history and through this very difficult period where the sacred feminine was so vilified and only now are we starting to grapple, really seriously grapple with, you know, shifting away from this solar world where everything is about money, capitalism, unrestricted growth rationality we're only now as a like as here in the west or i think are we starting to see oh basically that's not working there needs to be equanimity of dark and light without a balance we go too far into the solar literally everything gets burnt the earth gets destroyed we get destroyed so you know we've gone so far into this and i think hecate is a spirit wherever she pops up is that reminder that if we go too far into the solar and we deny the lunar, we deny the sacred feminine, we deny the intuition, we deny emotions, that it is not good for us. And, you know, I mentioned cognitive behavioral therapy at the start of this, and I want to loop back to that and see how therapy, because, you know, we all need therapy, healing is a process. Um, I believe it is our process of our life, you know, I can't complete talking about the history of Hecate without bringing um, C.G. Jung into this and his work on anima, you know, the feminine soul, you know, like that, and drawing from his work, this journey of individuation, that to become whole is to incorporate both the shadow and the self, that the soul is light and dark. And, you know, it's this rejection of what's purely solar, of toxic positivity. So, you know, that's that journey. I think that we're on here in the West. I think it's something we're really trying to work with. And I think that's why Hecate has returned um, to popular cu culture. I do get really concerned, you know, I get a lot of messages from people who have kind of been influenced by what I would say the post Crowley Hecate where, you know, she's horrible and she'll fuck you up and all of these other things. I do get concerned when I see that because I do fundamentally see Hecate as a spirit who can be very, very scary for sure. Um, and that she scares the life into us that, you know, it's like when we are drawn to horror movies or the macabre. It is a way for us to find a safe location in exploring the darkness within us, our own shadows, and the darkness within humanity. Hecate, I think, is that, that safety. I think Hecate's cave, when we go in there intentionally to do healing and face our own traumas, face our own shortcomings, uh, face parts of ourselves, that are really beautiful that kind of got you know chopped off along the way to conform when we go into hecate's cave we're doing all of that work and that work is inherently emotional 
And I even think like the rise in popularity of somatic therapies and internal family systems I, and other types of work that are really emotion focused um, and soul focused, that I think all of this is kind of correlated with the return of Hecate in different areas of the culture from, you know, witchcraft to religious practices, to theurgy, to psychology, to academic examinations of the records from antiquity. I feel like this resurgence is part of a larger kind of global correction, which of course is reflected in our own need for wholeness and to recover from all of this artificial light that we've been subjected to for centuries upon centuries. I hope you have enjoyed listening to part two of Hecate's history. Um, obviously, there are many, many things I didn't get into. Uh, I may have botched up a couple of names or so along the way. I apologize if I have. If you have any questions, as always, you can uh, get in touch with me at info at keepingherkeys.com.